How is everybody tonight? I am so glad this isn't virtual. Welcome. My name is Matt Judd. I am the Dean of Natural Sciences. Woohoo! Yeah. And, and we're here to celebrate Dave Land Career Night in Horticulture, and I wore my best Hawaiian shirt in honor of Dave. All right. Because I think all of us in here who have been at Mount Sac for a while um, owe a lot to Dave. This program owes a lot to Dave. And, and this, this evening, this is one of my favorite nights. As a dean, I go to a lot of advisory meetings. I go to career night. And this is one of the nights that I point to, to other programs and I say, if you want to know what you should be doing for your students, you got to go check out Ag Career Night. Because uh, this advisory committee, the strength of those, all those wonderful people you got a chance to interact with out there, our, our industry partners as we call them, from lots and lots of different companies and different uh, portions of the industry, of the horticulture and agriculture industry, they work with us and they help guide us um, to tell us what our curriculum should be, to tell us uh, what's new, what's coming down the pike so we can try to prepare you for the best possible careers in horticulture that we can. And I think what this night really, really speaks to is if you can dream it, if you can think of it in horticulture, there's a place for you. If this is something that you love, if you have passion to grow things and to be involved in this industry, this industry absolutely wants you in it. And, and so this is a great opportunity to learn, to hear, so I hope you'll, you'll, you'll listen and enjoy and have fun and, and for God's sakes, follow your passions. I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to say one thing tonight I, uh, before I introduce um, Brian Scott. Um, I've been the dean of natural. I've been a dean, a dean, not the dean, but I've been a dean in natural sciences for 15 years, and I taught at Mount Sac for 20 years before that. So I don't know how many of you in here are 35 years old or older, but if you're not that old, I was here at Mount Sac when you were born, and I'm retiring this summer. And thank you. <laughs> like finally, um, but but it's this has been such a great place to work and be because um, those of you that transfer, those of you that have been to other schools, you know that there's nowhere else you're going to find faculty like our faculty with the passion for students and the passion for helping you that they have. And when you think about our Hort faculty, Brian and Jennifer and Chaz, and you think about Jesus and Irma and our amazing staff and what we do, what you do, those of you who help us on the farm, um, to create this amazing environment, this amazing learning environment is incredibly special. And it means a lot to me to be here every year because I so appreciate that. Um, uh, when you have great faculty, it makes you look good. Like people think I'm really good. Um, and I'm not, I don't really do much. But, but I have these amazing faculty who do everything. It's pretty fantastic. So I'm glad you're here. I, wanna, I think Mount Sac is the best community college in the state, probably in the world. <laughs> And, and I think this department is, is the best CTE program on campus. I'm biased, but I, I still believe that's true. And without further ado, I want to introduce the chair of that department, somebody who works super, super hard to put all this together. Um, please give a warm welcome to Brian Scott, the chair of the Ag Department. And Jennifer Hinestrosa. I didn't know you were coming up, too. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Just, do you want me to do it now? Yeah, I might as well do it now. So it's there. Well, thank you guys. You guys appreciate our, how is everything out there today? Great. Give a hand to all the vendors, everyone who supported that. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, I'm going to do some introductions. I just wanted to start off with this one and uh, just, just to give this person a kind of a 
special introduction today um, because he's earned it. And um, so I wanted to talk about a major accomplishment of one of our full-time faculty, uh, what they've done in the industry as well as for our program. Um, and so I, I stole some stuff out of, a, uh, out of an article and this was the, the title of it, How an Outrageous Idea Transformed Dodger Stadium. Did I give it away? Let's see. <laughs> All right, so if you guys aren't aware of what Chaz has done at Dodger Stadium, um, talks right there, it has to be the MVP of Stadium Gardens. This is out of the March, I think March 13th edition of LA Times, big full two-page spread or, or more of uh, talking about what he and his crew accomplished. It's the only stadium in the nation to have certified botanical garden status. Busted his butt. He started there quite a number of years back. I know he had a vision way back then. Um, but this was uh, a long time in the making to make this happen. And so like I said, it's the first sports venue with an accredited botanical garden. Isn't that an awesome shot right there, downtown LA? That is great. And it's because of these guys, you know, Chaz leading his crew and, and the crews. And it points out in the article that their, uh, their mascot is the Aztec Eagle, which is a symbol of courage and strength. And if you guys know Chaz, he's, he's the kind of guy who wants to uh, make sure that the proper people um, are, are recognized for being the important part of what goes on, all right? And so these are his guys, and, and, and they made this happen. And then the Isla de Tequila, all right? I think people can appreciate that. Another one of the staples there at the stadium um, that was created. If you guys haven't gone out there yet, they're doing uh, botanical garden tours now, so we can talk to Chaz about that. The article points out it took five years, but you know I think it began even longer ago when he started back in 2010, because I heard him talking about big plans way back then, all right? And, uh, and the process started uh, a long time ago. So anyways, Chaz, congratulations, man. Yeah, you do a great job there and for us. So the, uh, there's a link there. If anybody wants to link to that article, I can certainly uh, forward that to you. So my job here tonight is to just introduce special people who are giving presentations tonight, but also to recognize our faculty and staff. And you guys aren't really aware of the work that goes into putting a program together and keeping it going. We have an advisory committee. Anyone who's on the advisory committee, stand up. I can't see you anyways, but advisory committee to stand up. A lot of them were out there. You guys talk to them, all right? Their names are on the bottom of this program. It's, it's like a who's who in the industry. We went around and had a meeting today, and they put a lot of work into making sure that the program is meeting the needs of the industry, because that's what we're here for, all right? To make sure that you guys are prepared to, to go out and take on the challenges within the industry um, as future business owners or employees. Uh, also, our, our faculty all right, work really hard. Um, I introduced Chaz already. A lot of you guys know Chaz, all right? So Chaz, <laughs> Jennifer Henestroza. <laughs> but we, we also have uh, our adjunct faculty. I don't think Jesus was able to make it tonight, but give him a round of applause. Not only does he do that, yeah. <laughs> but Jesus is the production. Uh, manager of the nursery as well. We have uh, Danny Akers. I know Danny's here somewhere. <laughs> Alicia Baugh. <laughs> Bill, and Bill Millward. All right. And I know I, I always, I hate doing that because I know I'm, you, anything, who else? Am I forgetting someone? Are we good? That's good. Oh. <laughs> Arnita, what do you teach? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even gotten to that part yet, but since Arnita jumped the gun, you guys met Arnita up here if you came in. She's our career specialist, and she can help you guys with resumes, interview skills. So give it up for Arnita back there. Yeah. 
Um, and, and our staff, I mentioned Jesus, but we have Irma who works extremely hard, all right? So Irma Arvisu. And all of the students that work out at the nursery, all right? They bust a mission out there, fantastic. We've got like 14 new students working at the nursery right now. You know, this is obviously post-COVID. Uh, I know there were a lot of things going on and uh, we weren't able to be around and it's been a mission to get back onto campus and to get things going again. And, and we're gonna, we're committed to, to keeping it going. So um, all of you students who are here tonight, everybody who's coming in person as well as doing online classes, you know, we appreciate all of you guys and, and we're here for you. So if you need anything, please, you know, know that you can approach us and uh, and our job is to teach but our job is really to again to make sure that you guys find your where you need to plug in all right in the industry and to, to go from here and beyond through life so um, never hesitate okay all right I think that's a the last thing I want to do is um, just read down a list of all of the people who donated raffle prizes and who are out there at the career fair and uh, if you got all those raffle tickets, bills out there taping the winning tickets to the prizes, I told them that I think, oh, I don't know, I don't even have a ticket, but you know, one of those Makita coffee makers, God, I gotta have that. <laughs> so hopefully that doesn't go claimed. But anyways, on your way out, you guys tonight could check your tickets against those and, you know, and uh, take somebody else's gift. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the extra credit for the, you know, coffee maker, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> All right, so we had uh, Tree Pro. Go ahead, give it up, Tree Pro. All right. Imperial Irrigation, Imperial. They, they did the coffee maker, so thank you, Imperial. Uh, site One, gift card. Uh, Iverde, plants. Who can, who can use more plants? Yeah. Netafim, gift card. Uh, Lawn Master gift card, Gothic, Plants, Hunter, brand new FX lighting system, no, <laughs> no, hats and a gift card, <laughs> Brightview, gift box, uh, Ecotech, a gift card, and RPW, a bunch of gas cards, wow, that's important, Woo! 100 bucks in gas cards, right on, okay. So I think I've acknowledged everyone. And Matt, thank you for all your years of service to, to the division. We really appreciate it. We're going to miss you. And our associate dean, uh, John Ventula, who's listed down here. I know he couldn't make it, but he was at the meeting earlier. Uh, and, and so give it up for John, too, as well. So right now, Jennifer is going to come up and talk about um, some very appropriate things about how you really get those pieces of paper once you earn them. So. <laughs> All right, so I, what I'm here to talk about, oh, I guess I should take my mask off so that you can see my face. Uh, so what I'm here to talk about is how to go about applying for those degrees and certificates and when to do that and all of that because even if it might not be relevant now, hopefully by the time that you're ready, you'll be ready, you'll remember this and think about it and if you don't remember, then you know that you can come back and ask me and I'll tell you again. I'd be happy to tell you as many times as I need to. Uh, so I just wanted to go over a little bit of just to an introduction to what degrees and certificates we have. I know a lot of you are probably aware of this, but we do have five different horticulture related degrees. Four of them are regular AS degrees, and then we also have an associates for transfer in plant science. So those are all the, the associates degrees that we have, but we also have 11 different certificates. The difference between the degrees and the certificates is for the degrees you need general education and a lot more courses, and then the certificates don't require you to take any of the general education classes. They focus specifically on the horticulture, and those are much shorter also. So those are only six classes. It's 18 units for each one of those certificates. And when you, when you graduate, you can get 
more than one degree if you want to. You can get more, more than one certificate, and many of our students do graduate with at least one degree and several certificates, if not more than one degree. So if you have interest in different areas, you can certainly complete more than one. You don't have to just have one goal. As much as the Mountie map wants to make you think that you can only have one goal, you can certainly complete more than that. And we're here to help you do that. Um, as the faculty, we are here to try to help you find the right degree or certificate for you and to help you make sure that you get through your pathway. Um, I wanted to let you know, some of you may have picked it up already, but I put a little resource guide out on the table that shows all of our degrees and certificate and lists all of the courses that are required for each of those degrees and certificates. It's a little three-page handout that's out there on the table. So if you didn't already grab one of those and you want one, feel free to grab them. You can also get them from our website. This is a picture of our website right here. And if you go to mountsac.edu slash horticulture, if you go to our website underneath the resources, the third one there is resource guide for degrees and certificates. And that's the exact same document that's out there right now. So you can always go back and find it. And I'll let you know right now that that list of degrees and certificates is accurate for now. But in fall, we have a couple of revisions to a couple of our degrees. And so that, that is gonna be sort of, it'll be somewhat accurate at that point, but for the ag science and technology degree, which is currently agri-technology, and also for the plant science degree, there are gonna be some changes coming in fall. So, um, so make sure that you check regularly to make sure that you're not using an outdated copy because they do change from time to time. But I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of where to find that information. Again, we can assist you. Part of our job is to help you find the right path for you to get to whatever your goal is. And to also, like, you know, a, a lot of people start with one goal. A lot of people come in and they either want to start their own nursery or they want to be a landscape designer and they maybe don't know that there are any other jobs out there. And then by the time you leave, you know, you guys have heard about so many different jobs tonight. So many people change their path. And we can certainly assist you with choosing the right path for you and helping you change your path if that's what you want to do. Um, we can, we can assist you with creating an ed plan to try to make sure that you're gonna get out of here in a timely manner so that you're taking the right classes in the right order that it'll make sense and it'll make things easier for you. And also we can help you with which classes are offered when so that you know, um, you know that you're not planning to take a bunch of classes in spring that it turns out are only offered in fall. So we can certainly help you either create your ed plan if you don't already have one, or if you have one that was created by a counselor, we can help you look at it and adjust it as necessary to try to make it more efficient for you to get through or to you know, change the direction or adjust it for whatever your personal goals are. We also encourage you to talk to your counselors, particularly for general ed re related questions and for transfer related questions. Although the counselors are, um, are certainly great for those kinds of questions. They're not as familiar with our programs as we are. So they can help you create a plan, but we can do a, a, a better job on the horticulture part. And again, we know our industry much better than the counselors do, so we can help you a lot with adjusting it towards what your personal goals are. Um, if you do see a counselor, we usually recommend Antoine Thomas because he is the counselor that is assigned to agriculture and we've been working with him for many years and he works really hard to make sure that he is up to date on our programs and that he and he's not afraid to ask us questions too if he doesn't know how to direct somebody. So I put his contact information here. It's athomas at mountsac.edu. And yes, you can see any counselor that you want um, and sometimes Antoine has a long time of a wait but he's also kind of worth it. I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Mountie map. If you're not aware already, the Mountie map is in your portal and everybody has a Mountie map based on what they declared as their goal when they first started, when they first registered at Mount Sac. So if you have not updated your goal and your goal has changed, it's a good idea to do that because that's gonna adjust your Mountie map. The Mountie map is sort of computer generated, so it's not, um, it doesn't adjust, and it only gives you a chance to identify one goal. So if your goal is to complete a degree and two certificates, and you might have to complete an ex a couple of extra courses in addition to the degree to get those two certificates, your Mountie map is not gonna show you that. So I wanted to point that out because it's, although it's good because it's automatic and everybody has a Mountie map, it's also not necessarily as accurate as you want it to be or as complete as you want it to be for whatever your personal goal is. So I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, 
The other thing I wanted to make sure that you're aware is that degrees and certificates are not automatically awarded. They need to be applied for, so even if you've completed the six courses that are required to complete a certificate, you haven't earned the certificate officially until you've applied for it. So a lot of people aren't really aware of that. A lot of people think that once you complete your six courses, you have the certificate. And it's really important that you go in there and apply for it, because it'll show up on your transcripts if you apply for it. If you don't, it doesn't show up on your transcripts. So just be aware that you do need to, to apply both for certificates and for degrees. The campus does a good people, a good job of no notifying people that they need to apply for graduation when they get their degrees, but as far as certificates, they, they don't really talk about those as much. Before you apply for either graduation for your degree or for your certificate, make sure that if you have any variances to submit, that you submit those or get those worked out. If you're transferring courses from other colleges that don't don't transfer directly for a particular course, you may need a variance for that. Um, if you have to substitute a class, maybe because you took something at someplace else but we feel it would be relevant for a certificate or a degree, we can do a variance for those. So I wanted to make sure that you're aware that that's possible and that you do want to get those submitted before you go ahead and apply because if you don't, they're going to turn you down and say you haven't completed it. So you have to make sure that all those variances are, are in and submitted. You also want to make sure that any transcripts from other colleges that you you may have taken courses of that from that will will contribute to your degree. Make sure that those transcripts have been submitted in advance so that when they do do your grad check, they'll look at it and they'll see all the courses that you have and they'll apply all of the courses that are from other colleges as well. As far as when to, to apply, the time to apply for degrees starts the semester before you're going to graduate. So if you're going to graduate in spring, you can apply to get your degree in fall. You can apply up till about the 8th to 10th week. There's always a deadline that's going to be listed, and it used to always be like the 8th week, but now they said that it varies depending on the semester, so you should always check the website. If you go to the class schedule and you see key dates, I put a picture of the website there. Underneath those key dates, it'll show you the last date of petition for graduation, which for this semester is tomorrow. So if you're planning to graduate this semester and you have not done this, this is your homework when you go home tonight is to apply for graduation. Uh, but it does vary by semester, so always check that deadline and, and know when that is. You have to apply to graduate by that deadline or else there, your application will be processed for the next graduation cycle, which means that you, know, you might graduate next fall, but then you might not be able to walk at graduation until the following spring. So it's, it's important to keep that deadline in mind as you get close to the end of the degrees. For the certificates, you can apply as soon as you've completed the courses, or actually you could even apply during the semester when you're taking the last courses that you need to take for your certificate. So you don't have to, there's, there's not a deadline within the semester for you to submit for those cert certificates. You can uh, submit those at any time. And then once you've completed the courses and they've confirmed that you've completed the courses, then they'll, uh, they'll, put that cer they'll apply that certificate and give you your certificate. So um, make sure that you apply for those though because they're not automatic. If you, if you receive financial aid, I would recommend talking to financial aid just to make sure because if you're going for a degree but you're also trying to get a certificate, the, applying for the certificate before you're ready to apply for the degree may affect your financial aid. So it's certainly important to talk to them before you do it. Um, even if it, if it does affect your financial aid, it doesn't mean that you can't get the certificates. Just wait to apply for them until you complete your degree as well and then submit everything at the same time so that you still get those certificates and your degrees. Um, but again, you can apply for those as soon as you've completed the courses and uh, then they'll, they'll put your, your degree on or your certificate on your transcript and they'll send you your actual certificate. That's pretty much it. For, oh wait, the, the, way that you, um, the way that you actually go ahead and apply for it is you, you go into the portal. They've made it very easy since COVID happened because now it's all online. All you have to do is go into your portal, log into the portal and go to the student tab of the portal. Go down to number 45, it's the last one on the list, and then you select the degrees and certificates that you're applying for and you submit, apply for them, and that's pretty much all you have to do. You can also find the forms on the admissions and records website, but it's a little bit more work to do it that way because you have to fill everything out. If you do it through the portal, it already knows all your information and you don't have as much paperwork to fill out. So easiest way is go to the student portal, go down to number 45 to apply for the certificates and degrees, and then you just select the ones you're applying for and submit them. Any questions? Yep. You mentioned that the program's gonna be like adjusted for the fall 
Yes. Can you talk about catalog rights for the students here? Yes. So catalog rights apply as long as you have been going continuously as a student. If you take a break for a year or more, then you have to start over with the new catalog rights. But if you started the degrees and are most of the way done, but you need a couple of more semesters, you still have catalog rights in, you know, to finish up the degree as it is now. The changes that are coming for those degrees are mostly adding classes. Um, I think Ag Technology is removing a couple of classes and adding some other classes, but the classes that we removed, I think, are mostly classes that either we don't teach anymore or people that don't usually take anyway. Um, and then the courses that we added are courses that are, are, are transferable to other colleges for their Ag Science programs. So if you, if you have questions about those specific degrees, you can certainly come and see us and we can explain those changes to you. We do know what those changes are going to be. We're just waiting for them to get all the way through the Chancellor's office and, and to come out in the catalog. And those will come out in the catalog in fall. But you will still have catalog rights as long as you've been continuously going since you started. You'll have catalog rights all the way up to your very first semester. Any other questions? OK. Great job. Thank you. <laughs>
I, I'm really happy you're here, and I really think more people should know about what you're doing, and I really think that our educational component should be feathered into some sort, of, and, and it should be tailored and feathered into some portion of this industry that you have created with your business model, and that we fit in together somehow, and I'm trying to figure that out, but this is the first step is having you here, so thank you. Come on up. Uh, good, uh, good evening, uh, Farmer Tanaka, stage name, Farmer Tanaka. Uh, <laughs> thanks for that introduction. Uh, I learned a long time ago, too, that I'm not very interesting, so I have to buy my audience. So all of you that came tonight, uh, when you walk out, you probably smelt those strawberries when you came in. Take a basket of strawberries home with you tonight. And hopefully you remember me. And when you go for job interviews, that's the same thing, right? Hey, make yourself known, make yourself memorable, follow up, follow up, follow up. Uh, I'm going to embarrass somebody here. So, so obviously all of you haven't heard of Tanaka Farms. I'm sure most of you have, but probably many of you haven't. Who, who didn't know Tanaka Farms and who didn't Google me before you came? Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Yeah, see? I'm, I'm going to waste 20 minutes of your time tonight. And you don't even know who I am. So you, sh you should research that, just like when you go for a job. Research, research, research. This day and age of internet, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to do that. So research. Since you don't know about me, I have to bore everybody else with my history. People come out to the farm. Uh, we're agritourism, agitation, agritourism. People come out to the farm to know, be, uh, be closer to where their food comes from. So they want to hear the story. So my story. Uh, I'm a third generation Japanese American farmer. My wife, Shirley, she's from Riverside. She comes from a farm family. My son, only son, only child, uh, he's uh, 40 years old now. I didn't want him to be a farmer, but uh, when we got into agritourism, there's a space for him, so uh, he now runs the business with me. But he doesn't know how to farm, so that sucks. <laughs> uh, his, his great wife, uh, she's a school teacher, uh, and his three kids. Uh, now I hope there's room for them and there's ability to carry on to be a fifth generation. So, Farmer Tanaka, the whole story. All right, I was uh, born in, uh, born here in Orange County, uh, Huntington Beach, California. Uh, I think that's me at three years old. I was born into the business, and most most of the you know generational farmers are born into the business, but that doesn't mean you can't get started in it. So I started at a young age, obviously sales, but I was talking to I was talking to Brian earlier. He said, what are you doing putting this thing on a Cinco de Mayo day? Come on. <laughs> That's why nobody's here, right? Mm, yeah. So, okay. I got a degree in ag business at Cal Poly Pomona. I knew what I was going to do from a young age. Uh, my dad brainwashed me pretty well, so I knew I was going to be a farmer. And so I met my wife at Cal Poly. She was a dietitian. Uh, she didn't want to marry a farmer because she knew how <laughs> difficult it was. Uh, being from a small farm, it's a lot of manual labor. She didn't want to marry a farmer, but... Look at me, you know? <laughs> uh, right out of college, 21, uh, got married, uh, got in the family business, growing strawberries and tomatoes with my dad. My goal was to be a big time farmer. So after about oh, eight years, we were growing strawberries and tomatoes, we tripled in size, uh, shipping our product across the United States. And then NAFTA came along, and believe it or not, backyard tomatoes were a big thing, and they would feed the whole neighborhood. So it took me about eight years, screw things up, got into debt up to here, couldn't, even more, couldn't get any more money from the bank. You guys are too young to remember, but uh, back in the 80s, mid 80s, interest rates were about 17, 18%. I was a bad risk, and it was uh, 22 or 23%, I think it was. Can you imagine, we're shipping every product across the United States. We pick, pack, we grow, pick, pack, sell, shipping, we pay for shipping costs, and we pay for dumping costs over there because we couldn't sell it. So I had about two, two bad years in a row like that. Uh, I had to downsize, uh, custom farming. I, I, I took on partners. Uh, it was a real struggle. My son was born in, I think, 1981 or something like that. And uh, all, all through that time, it was sleepless nights. And when you have your own business, it's really, really difficult. I didn't want him to be a farmer. So we kind of shied him away from that. Uh, in 1998, we, we moved to uh, the location we're at now in Irvine. We don't own the property. We lease it from the city of Irvine. It's dedicated open space, so hopefully they can't build there for, for a long, long time. 
but in 1998, we're doing some farmers markets, so we thought, well, let's go organic and get a get into the niche there. And so uh, by 2001, we were certified organic. We were doing 16 farm markets a week. We had pumpkin patch. We did strawberry farm tours. And we started our farm tours because uh, my son's preschool class. My wife invited him out to the farm, gave him a tour around the farm. And uh, they really liked it. And after about, geez, I think uh, 10, 15 years, 10 years, we had about 100 schools that were coming out. We were charging a couple bucks, and it was kind of a, a community service type of thing. Well, in 98, when we moved to this lo new location, we thought we, we need to find a way to monetize this. And so we added a wagon ride, a petting zoo, and then we charged the shit out of the schools. <laughs> Lo and behold, they came. And they kept coming. Uh, 2007, if you remember the downturn, the, uh, 2008, when we had the economic downturn, we thought we'd lose all our schools and they wouldn't come anymore. But they dropped all their field trips and they kept coming to the farm. They found it so important. Uh, so by 2007, we were doing no wholesale produce. We were doing no more farmers markets. We started a CSA program. And after nine years on a property, we finally turned a profit. And it wasn't because of the farming, it was because of the tours. So we dropped our organic certification because we didn't need it since we weren't wholesaling. Uh, plus, we couldn't, uh, well, I guess I'm a, such a crappy farmer, I couldn't figure out how to do it. So uh, we dropped our organic certification and we were doing some synthetics and this and that. But uh, we adopted responsible farming techniques. You have to learn how to market yourself. Uh, and marketing the business is no different. So marketing ourselves is responsible farming practices. We weren't organic, but we were responsible. And people, people kept in tune with that. They, they thought that was, that's really good. We're being responsible. So uh, our farm today, instead of having, uh, I think uh, we had our peak for two or 300 acres of tomatoes and about 100, 100 acres of strawberries, we now grow uh, uh, 90 acres. And we're growing three rows of this, two rows of that, over 60 different, uh, different vegetables. And it's very, very beautiful, but it's very difficult. If you have a small garden uh, having different crops, it's just as hard to grow 10 different crops as it is uh, 100 acres of a certain crop. So it's very, very, very difficult. Uh, so now we direct sell our produce uh, through our produce stand, uh, our CSA program. Uh, we had a 2,000 member CSA program at one time, but we tapered it down because we, we uh, found out we were losing money. So we, uh, we have about 1,000 CSA program now. Uh, fresh produce from the farm. And get to grow neat stuff like Romanesco, purple kohlrabi, which people don't know what they are, but we put it in the box anyways. <laughs> but for us, the most gratifying part, for me anyways, is that hands-on experience at the farm. Getting to pick things and, and actually eating right there. Our, our farm tour is based around that, hands-on experience, having these kids try onions. <laughs> and these kids will try those onion bulbs all the time. Families, mother, daughter, uh, watermelon right from the field. Picking strawberries, though, that's the key, that people just love to pick strawberries. That's, so, that's what they come out for in the springtime. And it's just great. Again, instant gratification for me to see the smile on their faces when they pick it and eating it. And they all just, just fantastic. This last picture is, yeah, you can't, can't beat that. But our, uh, so about 25% of our income comes from direct sales of our produce and our CSA program. And we, the farming part, which we really want to do, if we didn't have the other part, we'd be out of business. The other 25% of our income comes from our educational farm tours. We have about uh, 30, 40,000 uh, uh, grade school kids that come out every year, about 20,000 in pumpkin patch, 20,000 during our during strawberry season. 50% of our income comes from ag entertainment, I call it, agri agritainment, and that's like our pumpkin patch. People will pay to be entertained. They'll come out and buy pumpkins, go through a corn maze, and what they really like, well, what's really neat about uh, coming out to the farm here is our vegetable patch, where, of course, you get to pick vegetables out of the vegetable patch. And so kids love seeing things coming out right out of the ground. But they love the pumpkin cannon. <laughs> People like seeing things go splat. And uh, that is just, uh, it's great. But uh, we, this last year, we just started uh, Hana Fields. It's uh, our sunflower field. And we grew it just for the Instagram moment. So we, we opened up last year, and it was a huge success. And we, we just opened up this last weekend, where people come out, half the people that come out there 
just come out to take photographs. The other half will pick, uh, take photographs and take, pick, pick flowers and take home. Instagram moment, right? Isn't that a great picture? All right, so that, that's Tanaka Farms, and I'm not sure why they had me come out here and talk, but you know, some of the stuff is, if you're looking for a job, if you're looking for a career path, uh, I'll tell you what my competition is. We're, we're in this for profit. We have to earn our money from our farm tours, our farm dinners, and yet we have, oh, well I wanna talk about some of the th stuff we do also. Career opportunities at Tanaka Farms, uh, what it is is I call myself a dumb farmer that I can't grow a crop. I, I think I don't know who I was telling before, but I tell people I'm such a crappy farmer after earning a living taking money from little children. <laughs> so this is how stupid I am. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bad farmer. I, 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 that's why I went broke. Well, this is my best friend here on the right. Uh, his father and my father were best friends growing up. Uh, we wound up becoming best friends because he had a five acre farm where he had a roadside produce stand and he sold his property and he retired about uh, on about 10 years ago. And so like a dummy, I said, hey, why don't you come out and do the farming for me? So he came out and do the farming for me and now he has to hire somebody else to help him. So, you know, stupid farmer, another stupid farmer. Well, the gal on the left is uh, Sarah Pritchard. Is she here tonight? She's supposed to be here. Sarah in the house? Well, she, she's, a, she's a grad and uh, a uh, South Ma South Mount Sac grad, uh, and she'll be talking a little bit. She'll be here tonight. And she, uh, part-time, comes out to our farm, gives us some of uh, fertilizer and fertilization and, and watches the crop for us. So again, stupid farmer, hire a stupid farmer to hire somebody else. It's pretty good. Uh, career opportunity, oh, that's Sarah. She just turned, had her birthday apart, uh, in Vegas, so she <laughs> cleans up pretty nice. All right. Our, our, our competition, <laughs> and this is something I've been talking about a lot lately. Orange County Fairgrounds, Centennial Farms, beautiful place. We helped open it up, I think it was 20 years ago. They have a, a small one acre farm over there. That's a garden, and they give tours there too. They have about 100,000 kids coming through there every year, free. Their tours are free. So if you want a job, go there because they got a lot of money to give away. Renewable Farms, I just came across them on the website. Uh, they, have, uh, they have two farms now. I call it, they call them farms, but they're, they're gardens. They're big, oversized gardens. And the one's in the city of Anaheim, and one's in the city of uh, Aliso Viejo, I believe, that they just opened up a couple of years ago. Cities are thirsting. They're, they want to they have a showcase. They want to have a place that they call they have a farm. And so this, guy, uh, this company is, is going and setting up these little gardens at these uh, uh, cities that have a half an acre or a little lot plot that they can do. And they're renting it out for weddings and this and that. They try to grow food, but it's, uh, you know, it's not profitable without city, uh, city funds. Uh, more competition. The Ecology Center down San Juan Capistrano. Uh, they're a nonprofit that uh, just took over a 30 acre farm next to them. The farmer previously couldn't afford to pay the rent and water, and so the ecology farm took it over, the ecology center took it over, and they're making a farm tour and, and all that over there, which is, I mean, it's really great. Don't get me wrong. These, these nonprofits are fantastic. They're getting the word out about education, about getting back to your roots, and about agriculture in a whole. But also, again, it's my competition. I'm trying to do this for a living. They can get donations and, and uh, so forth to, to go without, about that. Uh, I, I, Ecology Center, I came across the website. They're looking for people to run their uh, uh, operation. Uh, they had a culinary that they were looking for, uh, paying $20, $22, $25 an hour. That's my competition. I can't afford to pay that. And so, again, for you folks looking for a job, career path, these nonprofits are not a bad place to look. Even my alma mater, Cal Poly Pomona, my competition, their pumpkin fest, they charge, but maybe not as much as they should because they don't need the money. <laughs> but so that's the Naka Farms. That's uh, what we do. And you ta uh, talking about you know, our career path and possibilities for, for employment, uh, you know, even, though, even though we're a small business, believe it or not, our operation is it's a multi-million dollar business. And we have a staffing of about 30 full-timers. 
during our pumpkin season we have uh, over 100 uh, part-timers that, that, that help us out but you look at these all these little operations and again i'll go back to the cities they're all looking for somebody to run their garden or something or and you guys all have that type of experience to be able to, to supply that uh something uh i i was asked about uh three things three questions you should ask uh employer one i came up with two two uh, two questions are managers promoted from within because you want to know if you're if the company promotes from within because you want to know what you're what you have available later on and probably the next biggest question is if it's a small business and it's especially if it's a family-owned business does the owner have children <laughs> <laughs> because if they do you're sol man right <laughs> job interviews you know, hey try to meet the superiors over we have people coming in at our farm all the time looking for a job and the ones that really strike me the best are the ones that i get to meet on the side when they're going through the interview and they come out and say, oh, there's Farmer Tanaka, uh, just as our, as our, uh, all our tour guides, I call them tour guides, uh, they're supposed to recognize me to all their customers and guests. Say, hey, look, there's Farmer Tanaka. Well, when a, a prospective employee comes up and they, they meet Farmer Tanaka, that's great because now I get to know them. Now, I'm waiting, and I haven't had it yet, out of all the hundreds of uh, employees we've had, that I talk to the ones that want to be a part of farming and, and be a possibility for bigger things later, none of them ever come up to me again. Whether they don't want to be there or they don't, maybe they find out they don't like the farm, but you have to make yourselves known. Make yourselves known to the people above you so that they know who you are and they get to know your work. Uh, good or bad, they get to know you. That's all I got. I know you want the strawberry, so. everybody. Um, Hi, how's it going? <laughs> um, s probably, so, well, a fair amount of you know me. I um, am adjunct faculty here. I've been teaching IPM with Chaz for a few years now. Um, I am a Mountie, so I started out here. Um, I'm currently in the PhD program at UC Riverside. And um, after I spoke last year at Career Night, we got a lot of interest in the PhD path. So um, I wanted to bring in Jeanette, who um, I originally met when I was w working at Disneyland. And she, I was working with her husband, and he told me, or I found out through the grapevine that she had gone through the program. And she um, very generously offered to um, talk to me and let me pick her brain for like, it feels like it was like over an hour that I just like asked her all kinds of questions and it was super helpful. Um, so anyway, Jeanette, I, I told her I would probably mispronounce her name, Jeanette Rapikavali. Okay, um, she did her bachelor's in horticulture at um, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and then went on to do a PhD program in P plant pathology at UC Riverside, and now she's working for Syngenta doing research, and it's really cool. So, welcome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the introduction, Gretchen. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, you know, as I was putting this presentation together, I was like, I need to impart these students with some kind of wisdom. Um, that they can take with them. And if nothing else, I hope you can see that your education is really what you make of it. Uh, when I was a horticulture student, 
I always felt like I was presented with very limited opportunities for what I could do afterwards with that degree. And that just couldn't be further from the truth. If you would have asked me you know, 10 years ago what I thought I'd be doing at this point in my life, it wouldn't have been this. I had no idea that this type of role existed. So um, you know, just thankful to be here tonight and uh, to be able to share my story with you. So I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I do not come from an agricultural background. I grew up in a very suburban environment. And I'm also a first generation college student. So you can imagine, I told my parents, I wanna to go to college and I wanna study horticulture. And they were like, what's that? We don't think you're gonna make any money in doing that. You should probably pick something else. Um, but I just always really had a passion for plants and insects. And I remember when I found out I could study horticulture, it like blew my mind. So um, I went to Cal Poly in uh, San Luis Obispo where I got my bachelor's in environmental horticultural science. And I, I can't say enough wonderful things about my experience at Cal Poly. Um, they have a really comprehensive horticulture program there. And quite honestly, I feel like a lot of the reason why I can do my job today and be successful is because of my horticulture training that I got at Cal Poly. So I got to do a lot of fun things. There's some, a picture of me there climbing trees in our boriculture class. Um, I was on a competitive landscape team where I actually met my, my husband. Uh, so yeah, I just had a really great experience at Cal Poly. And uh, at that time in their horticulture program, you could specialize in three different things. You could do turf grass management, you could do nursery production, or you could uh, do landscape design. And so I just thought, okay, you know, I guess I'll, I'll do landscape design. And as I was going through the program, I realized like about halfway through that I really didn't enjoy that and I wasn't very good at it. So, you know, I had that moment where I was like, you know, I, I need to figure out what I'm gonna do. And I think I also felt a huge sense of imposter syndrome throughout that experience because, you know, I felt so, far behind my other classmates. You know, a lot of them came from family farms. They had all this experience. And I was learning everything in the moment and just like frantically trying to catch up with them. Um, so I was fortunate. I took a plant pathology class during my junior year and I, I just absolutely loved it. I was so um, struck by the fact that these microscopic organisms could totally decimate our agricultural production. And um, you know, it was kind of at that moment, I was like, you know, I really like the science and I think I wanna become a plant pathologist. And I had a great uh, professor in that class, Dr. Michael Yoshimura. I ended up dedicating my uh, doctoral dissertation to him. Um, but he really took me under his wing and um, you know, showed me a lot of classical plant pathology techniques. We did some research in the lab and uh, you know, I, I decided that I wanted to pursue that from a research perspective. And he said, you know, if you wanna do this for a career, I highly recommend that you go to graduate school and that you pursue a PhD because that's, that's really what you're gonna need to be able to do that. Um, so it was at that moment that you know, I decided to pursue the PhD. And uh, I got that in 2016 from UCR. And uh, again, I had a really great time in grad school. It was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life. You have to be really, really determined to get through those programs. But um, I ended up in a molecular lab, which I didn't plan on, but uh, I really liked the advisor. And uh, I was working with a bacterial pathogen of grapevine called Xylella fastidiosa. So, you know, I really enjoyed my research, but again, I kind of got to the point where, you know, I was like halfway through the program and thinking about what I was gonna do next. And, and a couple of things became very clear. Number one, I didn't want to continue doing molecular research because I was stuck in a lab all day and I knew I didn't want to keep doing that. So I started thinking about applied research and you know, different, different avenues that I could pursue. And a couple things stood out to me, you know, either go into UC Cooperative Extension or pursue a job in industry. Um, so you know, I started reaching out to faculty in our department that, that run, um, ran applied research labs. And then I also started reaching out to some of the extension specialists and farm advisors in the area. And so I definitely wanted to give a shout out to Dr. Carmen Gispert. She's the uh, viticulture advisor for Riverside, San Bernardino and San Diego counties. And I basically just reached out to her and, and said that I was interested in going into extension. And she invited me to come and uh, you know, help her with her field trials and uh, take data. And you know, she just, again, just having another really wonderful mentor um, that was happy to have me along and, and teach me things. And so I kind of, you know, that reaffirmed for me that that was the path that I wanted to take. Um, I was at a professional pathology meeting that summer and I happened to meet a Syngenta field scientist at a graduate student and industry luncheon. And I had copies of my CV, my resume ready to go. 
and uh, gave it to him there. And then Syngenta called me several months later uh, for an interview. And I was really fortunate. They actually hired me for the position that I'm in now um, two weeks after I defended my dissertation. So just a little bit about R&D at Syngenta. Um, you know, Syngenta is one of the big three agrochemical companies. We're a global company. Um, and I think, you know, obviously agrochemical companies don't have the best uh, reputation, but, um, you know, I'm really proud of the work that I do with Syngenta, and it takes a really long time to bring a new pesticide to market. I think the public has this perception that we're just out there, you know, spraying things haphazardly, and it takes at least 10 years to bring a new product to market, longer if you're looking at a seed treatment, and like several hundred million dollars to get that done. And uh, Syngenta invests very heavily into R&D, well over a billion dollars a year. Um, and so there's several steps in that process from original discovery and formulation of a new active ingredient all the way to final registration. So I come in at that trials and field development stage. So just, I wanted to go over some of my responsibilities in this role. Basically, I conduct and manage all of the field trials that take place in the territory of Southern California and Arizona. So in California, I cover everything from uh, Ventura County South. And basically, we're just confirming that the products are gonna do what we say they're gonna do, right? I'm confirming the biological activity, uh, making sure that we're um, you know, targeting the right diseases and pests for those products. Uh, and then I take all that data, I give it to the product leads, and then they use that you know, to eventually register this product uh, federally and at the state level. Um, and then we continue developing those products even after they go to market. I work with my commercial colleagues, my sales reps, my tech service reps, to make sure that we're continuing to support those products um, you know, so they can sell them to our customers. So a little bit about crop diversity in the desert. I'm sure you know both Southern California and Arizona farm year round. Um, and it's a notoriously challenging territory to run because I never get a break, right? I hear from my colleagues in the Midwest who are stuck inside for six months because it's snowing. And uh, you know, when I'm working when it's 120 degrees you know, in the desert in the summer. So, um, But I try to see the positives in that. I get to work with a really wide spectrum of crops. I grew, you know, probably 25 different crops last year and uh, worked with an equally diverse uh, spectrum of diseases and pests. So everything from tree nuts and vines, forage and fiber like cotton and alfalfa, fruiting veg, leafy veg, brassicas. I had a pomegranate trial last year, which was pretty cool. Um, but, uh, you know, I feel really fortunate that I get to do this because I think ultimately it makes me a, a much more well-rounded scientist. So my research program, as a field scientist, I, I kind of operate similarly to an extension specialist. I mean, I'm expected to have general knowledge of all the major crops and pests in my territory. Um, and I'm focused primarily on conventional chemical control, but I will test whatever Syngenta has coming down the pipeline. So that could be biologicals, um, could be plant activators, you know, whatever we have in development. And along with that, I also work in all the major disciplines. So I test insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, nematicides, again, whatever we have coming down the pipeline. Um, but due to our really hot, dry climate, I would say 90% of my research program uh, is insecticide trials. So I just kind of wanted to take you through a typical year for me. Every January, I get a work slate from Syngenta that's essentially just this really, really long Excel spreadsheet um, with all the trials that they want to place in my territory for that year. So it'll list, uh, you know, the active ingredient, the crop, the pests that they want to target, and basically where they want that trial to go. Um, so I get that in January. I pretty much immediately have to organize that and plan out my year um, and get into the field so we can start catching some of these pests. So, you know, I have to figure out where the trial's going to go. I have to calculate how much seed I need, how much chemical I need, all my supplies. Um, and then get those trials in the field. And then of course, I'm gonna apply the products and start taking data. So I do make all of my own pesticide applications. I have a qualified applicator license in California with a category J, which is demonstration and research. And then I have an equivalent license through uh, the Arizona Department of Ag. And we're doing mostly small plot work, so I can do all of this with a hand boom, and I just wear a, a half mask respirator, and uh, we get it done. So I want to go through some examples of just some of the typical trials that we do and how we evaluate them. Um, so I know you guys have an IPM class. 
So I'll ask you, if I'm running an insecticide trial, right, I have this field, presumably there's a uniform distribution of insects, I'm gonna apply these products, what am I gonna do to make sure that they're working? How am I gonna evaluate that? I'm gonna sample and then how, I'm, how am I gonna compare if one's working? Yeah, so we're comparing to our check, definitely, but we're actually counting the numbers of insects in all the treatments. So I have a picture here. This is typical for me in the back of my truck. You can see the pile of leaves down below. So if I ask people, you know, how do you evaluate aphids? One leaf at a time, okay? So we're literally harvesting heads, whole heads of lettuce per plot and uh, counting all the insects. And so I just have some examples here. Um, you know, top pictures, there's some leps there. On the right, on the top, we had tremendous aphid pressure in Yuma this year. In our checks, we were counting like over 600 aphids per head of lettuce. So we spent a lot of time in the field. And then this bottom right-hand corner, this is our Western flower thrips trial. So we dislodge the thrips onto a yellow sticky card. And then we take that back to the lab and count all the immatures and the adult thrips and report those separately. So incredibly laborious work. So you have to do absolute samples, not relative. No, yeah, it's literally, we're taking five heads per plot and working, working through the field. And it's just me and my one research associate doing all this work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, fungicide trials are much easier. I can essentially, if it's a foliar disease, I go through and I say, that looks like there's 60% disease in this plot. So much, much easier um, to get through those trials. And we work on all kinds of stuff, soil-borne pathogens, foliar pathogens. There's a lot of fun diseases in the desert too. This has been a new one for me. Um, I've also been doing some nematicide work and I, I have to give a shout out to Dr. Oli Becker at UC Riverside. He's a nematologist there and um, kind of you know, helped me learn how to conduct these trials. And I'll tell you, there's nothing more satisfying than pulling like a really galled carrot out of the ground. It's just, you know, you're like, your inoculations work, the pressure's good, it's the greatest feeling. <laughs> Herbicide trials, I don't do too many herbicide trials because we have so much mechanical cultivation, in, especially in the produce crops, but I always tease the weed scientists that they have it so easy. And I mean, same type of thing, you go up to a plot and you say, you know, clearly here in the treated plot, it was 100% control. So we can get through these trials very quickly. Um, so, you know, we, we do this all year, work on all different types of projects. I submit all that data and then in November every year, all the scientists from across the country, we come together and we summarize all the field trials that went out that year. And then from there, you know, the, the product leads can make decisions about um, how we're going to move forward with those actives. So I feel like it's only fair to tell you, um, you know, what I like and what I don't like about this job. Um, there's many challenges associated with doing field work. Um, the traveling is constant. You can imagine, I cover such a large area and even, you know, just driving around to scout my fields because I have to know when to spray, right? Um, I probably travel 5,000 miles a month and um, I'm away from home well over 100 nights a year. So definitely a lot of travel. Um, An organization, oh my gosh, you have to be so organized. Um, you know, I probably manage at least 75 field projects a year. Um, so I have binders and binders of, you know, trial maps and sheets of data. Um, it's just so imperative that you're really organized. Um, I mentioned things about, you know, trial placement. Some pests we can only get once a year. So if I'm not prepared to get that trial into the field, we totally miss our window. And then we have to wait a whole other year. Um, and then also for the desert, I mean, it's very physically demanding. You know, I work mostly with produce crops. All of those are still hand harvested. So whenever I get protocols every year, I look immediately to see if they require yield. <laughs> because, um, yeah, I mean, we've just, you know, harvested melons. And one of the first jobs I did, um, we harvested over 1,700 heads of lettuce in two days. Um, so yeah, it's very, very physically demanding work. And then you're totally at the mercy of the environment. My first summer in Yuma, it was a high of 122 degrees. I think Phoenix got up to 128 that year. And there's cotton and alfalfa out there in the summertime. Um, so, you know, again, it's just very, um, gosh, it was a hellish summer. It was so yeah. awful. Um, so th those are some of the main challenges of this type of job. 
But there's also a lot of things that I love because you're probably wondering like, why, why do you keep doing this every year? Um, I get to be outside, you know? I'm not stuck in an office all day. I get to be in a lot of really beautiful locations and that's always something that I appreciate. Um, and honestly, I feel like I'm utilizing everything I've ever learned throughout my education. I mean, you know, everything, even things like soil science, it's all directly applicable to what I'm doing now. And, you know, uh, again, I talked about, you know, all the different crops I work with, the diversity of projects every year. I don't have time to be bored. There's always something new to be exploring. Um, and then I really love the people that I get to work with, you know, the collaboration with public and private researchers, PCAs. Uh, this PCA in the bottom right hand corner called me one morning and said, Jeanette, I think I have nematodes in my field, in my onion field. Can you come and look at it? I'm like, sure. So, you know, went over there, took a look, brought some samples to UCR. I mean, those types of relationships are what I really enjoy. And then, of course, you know, seeing the impact of our products um, on the agricultural communities. You know, when I get to give a grower a tangible tool to solve their problem, it's the greatest feeling. Okay, so for those of you who are looking for a job in industry, um, I highly recommend, you know, start thinking about what part of the industry you want to join. There's so many different areas. And, um, you know, I'm in our crop protection field development group. But we have a seeds organization, we have Syngenta Flowers, there's all different types of things you could be doing. So start checking out you know, company websites um, and see what types of qualifications are required for those roles. And then you know, if you're getting to the point where you're looking for a job, you know, start tailoring your resume to meet those qualifications. Networking, I cannot stress this enough. I would not be where I am today or be successful in this role if I didn't have a really, really strong network. And that goes back to even the people at Cal Poly when I was an undergrad. I still talk to those people and call them for advice. So, I mean, truly, I cannot stress that enough. Your network is gonna be so important. Um, and then try to attend professional conferences if you can. Um, you know, and, and if you're looking for a job, have updated copies of your CV or your resume ready to go. I think business cards are really helpful, um, you know, for that quick introduction with somebody to give them your information. And then I think this is a big one. If, you know, if you're interviewing, be really honest about your professional experience. When I interviewed for this job with Syngenta, I knew the first thing they were going to ask me is, do you have field experience? And I was going to have to tell them no, right? Because I didn't at that point. Um, but, you know, I said, here's all the experience that I do have and how I can be an asset to your company. So just be confident in the skills and experience that you do have and, you know, really show them what you can bring to the position. And with that, um, you know, I want to thank you guys again for having me here tonight. And uh, I think I'm almost out of time, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Okay. Um, okay. Um, what can you say about the role of the PCA in crop development? So you, you deal with them in the research and the research realm, but mm -hmm. what is your experience with PCAs in the research realm, and, and what's, what do you know of them in terms of uh, basic ag production? Like if I'm growing strawberries, how many can I use them? They are highly essential. High, PCAs are highly essential. They are critical to oh. agricultural production. Critical? Yes. To agricultural production. Mm -hmm. well, that's good. Okay. Yeah. So why is that? What do they do? They're, I mean, they're such a valuable resource. They walk those fields every day, right? So if I need to know maybe when, you know, to plant a trial, what time of year do I plant this trial to catch this pest? I call a PCA. Okay. You know, they're the, they know everything. They walk those fields every single day. Yeah. Biological controls. Um, so, you know, I think we have some, I mean, I'll be honest, I think Syngenta is, is trying to expand their biopesticide portfolio at this point. I know we're working with some smaller biological companies. For the most part, you know, we produce a lot of um, conventional pesticides at this point. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs>
I apologize. So everybody give Gretchen a hand as far as adjunct faculty. You know, it's getting older thing, you know, it just plays on you. The other thing is uh, the counseling that Jennifer talked about. We have another, so Rudy approached me today. Apparently, we, we did a landscape design for Rudy pre-COVID, and he's one of the counselors at Mount Sac, and he walked up today and said, anything your students ever need? He goes, that landscape design that I got, my house is like just jamming, everything is great, and so we have another contact and counseling as well for, for you guys, so. That's, that, that's how things work around here. You know, you do stuff for people and then you get it in return. You guys all benefit from that, right? Very cool. So, well, our next speaker, all right, I think the first time I met Brandon was um, what, uh, you were sticking your head out of a tent, a spyglass or something like that. He came up to volunteer. We do that every year in February and uh, one year in particular, we, did it, we, we stayed at a campground <laughs> up in Monterey. And I think that year, might, maybe the weather wasn't even that great. It seems like whenever you camp, it's going to rain. Isn't that the, the protocol, right? So, uh, you know, the topic for tonight that Brandon's going to um, talk about is, it's not that relevant, right? Water, water savings, anybody, you know, what's water, like, no, no cutbacks, nothing, no, no, no issue, right? Not in California, not anywhere. But anyway, so I'm going to just turn it over to Brandon now. He's from the... Uh, Chino Basin Water District, and he's going to talk about all the great stuff that's going on in water management there and the tools that they're going to impart on you. So, All right. Hello, everyone. Like uh, Brian mentioned, I, I've been in landscape my entire life. My parents had a landscape company. We'll get to that. But I thought I knew how to use a rake. I thought I did until I went to Spyglass, and I was getting railed that I wasn't raking the, uh, the sand traps correctly. It's, it's insane. Um, so like Brian said, my name is Brandon Burgess. I work for the Chino Basin Water Conservation District. I'm a conservation specialist. And I wanted to start, there we go, with a little bit of what we do, because it's a little bit of a special uh, thing that we do here at the Chino Basin Water Conservation District. So we are a water conservation district. Like I said, we started in 1949 to help protect and preserve the Trino groundwater basin. Uh, that's for the San Bernardino communities, and that's where actually over half of the water that we get, uh, we use from that groundwater. So it was created by farmers that knew sustainability of our groundwater is really what's gonna keep this um, area for development and moving forward. We cover seven cities. You see, I put Mount Sac there, so we're just east of this, so eastern, uh, western San Bernardino County. Chino, Chino Hills, Fontana, Ontario, Montclair, Rancho Cucamonga, and Upland. And we focus on demand, so we don't, we're, we don't have a water supply, we, we focus on demand and water conservation. And so they gave me this wonderful slide. So our mission is threefold. So we do demonstrate, educate and percolate. So our facility. So has anyone been to our facility? We're located, Chaz, a couple of you. Well, thank you all. You should come again. We, during COVID, that was one thing we did. We really worked in our demonstration garden. So I have a couple updated photos here. But we have a four acre demonstration garden where we work with our community. So we practice what we preach. We do workshops there. Um, and we really wanted to make it a demonstration garden, not as a botanical garden, although I am excited. I want to go to Dodger Stadium, right? We'll, we'll connect. But it, we didn't want to have a demonstration garden that was you know, just a bunch of different pieces. What we really wanted to do was section it off, give more of a look with turf replacement, like the yarrow here on the right, places to sit to come and enjoy do sculptural gardens, and give ideas, smaller sections of what you can do in your yard or open spaces and really connect in a low water use. Everything in our garden, other than our turf area, um, we water a, one day a week. Most of it is every other week or once, once a month. The second one is educate. So something that I really enjoy doing is connecting with our community. 
We do K through 12, so um, another department, which is our, our uh, community programs. Today we had a bunch of uh, kindergartners coming, learning about sustainability, about how to protect our groundwater. We work with higher education. We're working with uh, UC Cooperative Extension on a tree study. I think we're in the seventh year of that, and of planting a tree, getting it established, putting mulch, and not watering it. These trees haven't been watered. Um, for five years now after establishment, so we do work with that. Um, we do work with professionals on landscape management uh, and water management, we'll cover that as well. One of the things that I do personally is I teach transformation of our urban landscapes to more drought tolerant, to, to more sustainable landscapes. And last thing, percolate. We own and operate and this is what gives us our special district status. We own and operate eight of these retention basins. So if you are driving home, if you live east of here and you're driving on the 10 freeway and you see these big open pits of water, sometimes they're full, sometimes they're not. We own and operate ten or eight of those, and those are actually trapping rainwater, trapping water that's runoff from, um, from the local areas as well as taking imported water. We fill those up, the water uh, percolates down, giving uh, water to our Chino basin um, aquifer underneath. If it wasn't for those basins, we wouldn't be a special district and couldn't do all the great stuff. So why is all this important? Clicking. Yes, we're in a drought, right? We're hearing all this stuff. Oh man, Brandon's gonna tell us to rip out our grass. Sorry, Brian, I'm not gonna do that. Thank you. <laughs> Right, so this is, this is when you hear that the water restrictions, one day a week watering um, that, that we need to do, that water that they're saying we're, we're not able to um, have a very small allocation is from the state water project. So this is Oroville, this is by Lake Shasta, this is all the way in the northern part of California. This all comes down and you can see over the years, it's really depleted. This is the reason, one of the many reasons why. Also, this gets updated all the time, one of the tedious things that I do is I look at this map that gets updated once a week, and you can kind of see our severe drought, um, extreme drought, and all California, we're in some sort of above abnormal drought. Right, and so another thing to think about is since our beginning in 2022, from July through March, we've had the driest three, or beginning to a year, calendar year, in recorded history since they've been paying attention to the climate. It's, it's dire, right? We had a good rain in, in December, we had a week of rain, but other than that, we're, it's pretty sparse. And so over 50% of um, our watering in our area, we use outdoors, right? So that's why they're really calling, especially on SoCal, that, to reduce our water by 20 to 30%. As a water manager, I'm like, oh, that's easy, take a day off the controller, right? There's a little more that goes involved, but we all heard in January, in starting in June, um, portions of LA County, San Bernardino County, and Ventura have to reduce to a one day a week watering. So I'm getting a lot of calls, right? So okay, that's great, we gotta shut it off, everything's gonna die, but really it started a whole nother conversation with this drought, something that really started to, to change the way I see landscapes really getting into landscape design. And it kind of opened it up to, what does my landscape actually do for me? What does it do for my home? What does it do for the local area? Is it low water? We start thinking about our landscapes a little bit differently. There's a picture of one of my coworkers' front yard. He waters this once a month. And it's not necessarily a low, um, it's not like a no maintenance, but it's a lower maintenance and it's a more specialized. Something that I really enjoy is it, the irrigation work is still there, but it's a more technical irrigation work. You have to know your plants. You're not gonna take your mower in there and just run over all those plants, right? It's detail work. It also brings pollinators and, and birds and habitat. It also, sustainable landscaping is rain capture. So we slow, sink, and spread. I was on the native plant garden tour Theodore Payne put on a couple of weeks ago. This is the picture of a house up in La Crescenta. 
they cut out part portions of their driveway so that the water slows down and then it goes into their, their dry creek bed. Small little changes, huge impact. Here's a beautiful turf replacement. Um, they're not gonna do any sports on there. I don't think they could hit any golf balls on that, but that's Carex, pan, uh, Carex panza, that's a, that's a native plant. It's watered once a week with drip irrigation and it's mowed like twice a year. And they just use an uh, electric weed eater. Kids can play on it. You can see it takes um, some uh, foot traffic as well. Are we gonna go completely to native plants like that? No, but there are certainly areas. Another um, increase, you guys have um, wonderful classes about this, so drip irrigation, drip design. Everything's be, a lot of it is, is getting converted to drip uh, irrigation. And then higher irrigation efficiency. So it's not just we have our sprays, we need to rip everything out and put drip. We need to learn how to maintain, evaluate what we, um, what we have on site. That's a big part of my job. You can see I have my little catch cans out there. I'm doing a, a distribution uniformity test. I'm fi figuring out precipitation rate, how the water is being delivered on the site so I can come up with the irrigation schedule. It's no longer acceptable to do 10 minutes a day every single day, right? That's the reason why they want us to do one day watering because they think we water seven days a week, right? So how did I get involved in all this? So a little bit about my background. So like I mentioned briefly, I've only ever worked in landscape. I absolutely blame my parents. My parents have either owned or operated a landscape company since I was little. So when all my friends in high school were sleeping in, going to the beach, I was waking up at 6.30, putting on my work boots. I didn't go to college right after, uh, right after high school. The Monday after I graduated, my mom's like, all right, well, you don't got nothing to do. You're gonna go get up in a tree and trim it. I'm like, okay, here we go. And so I took a little bit different. Um, I wanted to thank Jennifer. I didn't know that I had to apply for my associates that I had just finished in environmental studies. So thank you, I gotta do that tonight. <laughs> I learned something. I also learned seed to sesh. Something that someone taught me earlier in the, in the talk. That was something new. Um, but my career path was, was different. So like I said, my parents had me work um, on the tree crews, um, on the landscape installation crews. I started as groundman. They always put me at the lowest. The guys that I worked with would say, oh, you're the, you're the son. Like, you get paid a lot. I would have to show them my mom. Like, dude, you get paid more. I'd show them my paycheck, right? That's something. They always put me at the bottom and made me work, learn how, what hard work is work my way up to foreman, to heavy equipment operator. Once we were uh, doing bark beetle uh, abatement up in the hills up here in, in the, um, around Big Bear, and we ran out of trees, so I went onto the East Coast. I was cleaning up after hurricanes for about six months. It takes you all over the place. If you say yes and you're a hard worker, your career can take any turn possible. Small equipment mechanic, irrigation tech, irrigation supervisor, all those things, and what really changed it for me, um, and again, I'm pretty jealous. I didn't know about this program. I was taking 18, 19, just taking gen general ed classes over here. I didn't even know this was, was here. I would have taken advantage. But what I got into was certifications. I'm like, oh, there's something more. So I got obsessed with getting certifications. I got for the uh, water use efficiency practitioner from the AWWA, a uh, certified auditor from the Irrigation Association, Irrigator Tech, um, certified arborist, QAL, qualified water landscape, or efficient landscaper. I was taking anything that I could and I was really enjoying learning about this. So much so that I told myself, you know what, I wanna go out and I wanna teach those classes. So from that, from taking all these, these certifications, I became an instructor for Irrigator Technical Training School. I traveled all over the Southwest and I was just primarily teaching irrigation and doing side jobs because I didn't pay enough. But I was doing that for about three years. So what do I actually do as a conservation uh, specialist? Luckily, I get to do a little bit of everything that I love to do. One of the main programs, to keep it a little short, is I um, run the landscape evaluation and audit program. So this is offered in our district in those seven cities at no cost. Um, we go and do an irrigation audit. It could be catch cans. I could be working with, this, with HOAs, which are blowing up my phone right now because they're scared. 
HOAs, cities, schools. We also do it for residents. We give them consultation, a one-on-one -on -one, um, to help them manage what they have. They have landscaping ideas, something, uh, landscape questions. And the program starts with data collection. We go and collect all the data, plant. We do soil tests. We do root zone depth. We do plant type. I, mat I create um, a specific water plan for the sites, whether it be small scale, large scale. Um, for large commercial sites, I, I do mapping. That's just a basic Google Earth Pro. I create a water budget based on the landscape that they have, irrigation efficiency and come up with a water management plan with, with all that data. If there's an um, ability for them to remove turf, non-functional turf, I'll highlight that for them. We'll wor I'll work with them to get the rebates, to get the funding. Another thing that I really enjoy is our design, design assistance program. I did not design these. I can't take credit for that. But this is from the garden tour. Another native, uh, this is all on the left. That's 100% native plants on the right as well. And we work, with, uh, we work with the public on landscape designs. And, and during these past couple of years, everything that we did came online. So one thing we did is our, our website, inlandvalleygardenplanner.org. We have about 350 climate appropriate plants. We also introduced this design palette. So we, we narrowed it down to about eight different palettes for people to, to, um, to highlight. We did large front yard, medium, and small based on the average uh, size homes in our service area. And so this is an example of a rendering for the butterfly songbird garden. So this is somebody's front yard where it's gonna bring in the butterflies and the songbirds um, all year long. It also gives detailed uh, construction details. Uh, we go over irrigation scheduling and everything like that. Something we worked really hard on. Another thing that we do is we teach workshops. Uh, we just started doing them in person. I did irrigation basics um, in the garden for the first time. I've been doing these online uh, for Zoom, and it's just not been great. Uh, we also do professional training. And then every single workshop that we've done, we have over two, uh, 20 topics. They're all on our YouTube channel, cbwcd.org slash YouTube. And so how can you get into water conservation? Because it's, it's a little broad. That's just a little taste of it. That's what we do. Um, but things that really help for water conservation, whether it be in the private sector, work for a county like myself, or work for the state. Experience, right? Hard thing to get if, if we don't have the job. But landscape design, landscape maintenance, like myself. Irrigation design and maintenance. Arboriculture. Any kind of, because uh, you need to be able to talk with, with um, talk with people, with the public. Obtaining certifications, that's the route that I took. There's the quail certification, water use efficiency practitioner, CLCA uh, certified water manager, certified irrigation auditor. Uh, per, the professional certificates that, that are offered here, huge, huge things. We get people applying for jobs. Uh, it looks really highly of them that they, they, they come to the classes offered here. And then obtaining a degree, horticulture, ornamental horticulture, geology, environmental science, plant science, hydrology, anything in the earth sciences uh, looks good when thinking of the whole of sustainability for uh, water management. And paid internships if you can't get them. We just um, brought two people on board. Um, half of the time they're working with me big water management plans. The other t uh, half the time, they're learning how to take care of uh, plants and um, in our demonstration garden and irrigation in our demonstration garden. So always look for, for, for those if you're, if you're able to. And so I talked with our hiring manager. Um, I wanted to make sure I had some good um, perspective questions for you to ask an employer. And the first one is, what are the most challenging aspects of a job? Something to ask at the end. Whenever someone asks us about that, to me, it, it makes me feel like, oh, okay, they're looking for like, what's the, what are the challenges? And then they can reply and be like, I, I understand, and this is how they would kind of go about it. Shows, shows a lot of, um, uh, a lot of grit. In, if given the position, what's the potential for growth over time? And you don't want to necessarily say, like, hey, when can I become a manager? But you want to say over time, right? You want to say, hey, what's the, what's the potential growth over time? Is there room to, um, to go from here? 
And then lastly, what would a successful first year look like for this position? Right, so you're asking them, hey, once I kind of get, set, once the person gets settled in, what, what would be a success in your eyes for that position? And we could talk all about water conservation. I don't want to take too much of your time, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me or there's my email. Um, again, if you haven't been to our facility, we're located right here in Montclair. Um, highly recommend it. You can go to the front desk and ask for me. I could give you a full garden tour. It takes maybe 30 minutes to sometimes a couple hours, depending on how much we're going to chat. Any questions? Thank you. Oh, I, mean, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, besides the retention basins, is there like more methods that you use to conserve water? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's 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 big picture, right? R recharging our um, our aquifers is a big thing. So, our we're de we're de um, we're focused on the demand side, so just working with our community. Like I said, I work with cities, schools, getting, uh, one of the things that really shocked me, not, not necessarily, because I've been on all three sides of a board meeting, right? I've been the landscaper where they're telling me I'm doing a bad job. I've been a consultant third party where I'm telling them, hey, this is what you should do, and nobody wants to hire me because it's too expensive. And then now it, I kind of found the sweet spot. I'm, I'm lucky in that aspect that I don't have to charge a ton of money for my expertise, which is, which is a good thing. I know how to talk to the contractors because I've, I've been a contractor. I know what it's like. I know when the people are telling me. They tell me, oh, well, why aren't you putting in drip irrigation? Why aren't you replacing this? And I would pull out a packet <clears throat> of all my bids they didn't approve, right? I, I gave that to you six months ago, right? Um, so that's kind of our focus, working with people that are actually boots on the ground doing the management. Um, and consulting and even working with the other water agencies. That's, that's our main focus. I do track, um, as someone that goes through my landscape evaluation program, I do track their water uses five years leading up to the intervention with me, and then I do it for a year to two years after. So I do see if they actually saved. So we do programmatic evaluations, um, but um, that's kind of the focus. Yeah, hopefully they listen to us, right? Maybe they will now. <laughs> Anything else? No? OK. Oh, yep. What do you think the top three uh, water specific requirements are? Like, how do you look at this job? The top three. Um, good question. So depends on what you want. So for this job in particular, the Irrigations Association's uh, Certified Landscape Irrigation Auditor. Um, so that will surprise you how much of a, sp a spreadsheet goes into irrigation, right? I'm sure you guys know you take these classes. Figuring out precipitation rate, soil infiltration rate, slope, uh, root zone depth, right? It could get really, really um, intense. That, that's a great one. Um, also, the Qualified Water Efficient Landscaper, the Quell. That one um, is offered at no cost. If you look for that, uh, Metropolitan Water District is um, hosting those, and they do them online as well. Um, I think it's, it's a 20-hour class. I should know. I, I teach that one. I haven't taught it in a while. But that one is a no-cost one. That one, and the reason why those two in particular, they're um, partnered with the EPA and their water sense program. So when you s learn about WIBIC controllers, weather-based irrigation controllers, those are all certified EPA water sense. These programs, and there's only, I think those are the only two. The third one is the certified water manager from the CLCA. Um, they're actually combining those. Sorry, there's a lot of information. Um, but the, the Quell, Qualified Water Efficient Landscaper, and the CLCA certifi or Certified Water Manager is a dual certification now, which is a great thing. That's offered for free. Um, that looks great. Um, those ones. And then one that's a little bit um, tougher than those is the AWWA Water Use Efficiency Practitioner Grade 1. Um, a lot of math. You're dealing with indoor conservation. They make you do um, conversions of changing, you know, 7,000 toilets from three and a half gallons per uh, flush to 0.7, and then they only use it on this day during this month and these many days, and yeah. 
I forgot my calculator. I had to do that all on scratch paper, but I, I passed with a 76 and you needed a 75, so. <laughs> but those, those, are, those are some of the top three, but, but any, any one, uh, the certificates that you guys have here, um, they look, they're, they're awesome too. They hold a lot of weight when, when people apply for, for jobs. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No? Okay, well thank you all. You see, there's my email, my number. Feel free to contact me. So I forgot to mention, this is being recorded, um, and oh. yeah, so, you know, I always do that at the end, right? You know, that's a disclaimer, so anything you said can and will be held against you, for sure. <laughs> but it's going to be available after it gets closed captioned, it'll be available uh, next week sometime on the Mount Sac YouTube channel. Did you even know Mount Sac had a YouTube channel? All right, well, you're going to know now, all right? You'll be able to find this here, so that'll be a great thing. And Brandon, thank you for sharing about the, um, what was it, the songbird and butterfly garden. I'm going to send you my landscape design in my house. It's the, the rattlesnake, coyote, and ground squirrel garden, all right? <laughs> that's what I tend to attract. Uh, I don't know if that's an official good thing or bad thing, but. Uh, what, what's that, donkey? Oh, yeah, that's in Arizona. Got plenty of those. They're eating my Phoenix Robolinis in Arizona, the donkeys are, swear to you, all right? Honest truth. And then they poop in my driveway, okay? Uh, can't make this stuff up, so. All right, uh, let's see, where am I? Really, you guys know me in my class, off ramps all the time, right? Just out there, okay. So, our next speaker. Now, this is the part of the evening where we call it the Mount Sac experience, all right? Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, maybe we can call it, you know, whatever, just bear the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But this is, this is really uh, fun to have students that come back and talk about you know, where they're at now and some of the things they went through. Our first speaker, she, uh, wow, there's a lot to say about her. It's just, you know, this is a smile that lights up the room. But one of the coolest experiences was a Calico camping trip that we're gonna be doing again in October, by the way. And I'm like, gosh, she just goes up the side of the mountain like the, like the bighorn sheep. She just, boom, right up the side. Uh, just had a have a blast. Uh, she does everything she does. She enjoys doing, and just it just uh, is evident in that. So, I'm not going to delay any longer. I want to introduce Liz Mendoza to you guys, and she's going to come up and share her Mount Sac experience. Hello, everyone. So good evening. Oh, sure. Sorry. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Mendoza. I am currently one of the lead gardeners at the LA County Arboretum and Botanical Garden. Um, we're about 15 minutes away from the Huntington Gardens, and we are located in the city of Arcadia. There we go. Um, next to the Santa Anita Mall and Racetrack, uh, we are very famous for our peacocks. Oh, it's kind of like our th it's actually mating season. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> You hear them all day, every day. You th they make some funny sounds, man. It's crazy, some of the stuff that comes out of them. Uh, you scare them, you're driving behind them, it's like a honk, it's, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, so it's mating season right now too. If you guys wanna visit, a lot of people really wanna come around at this time of year. Um, their mating season is right now like around February all the way until early August. The <laughs> that's when they drop their feathers, so uh, a lot of people think that the males always carry their feathers all year long. They actually drop them every year, kind of like you know, like antlers and stuff. Um, so that's why when you see a lot of members walking around in here in the fall, you can pick up the feathers. It's fine. We don't really, you know, go ahead. Um, but if we see people walking around with feathers in the spring, we know they pulled them out. So <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> don't be them. Um, anyways, um, so I maintain about 30 acres of the landscape, including tropicals, a plumeria collection of over 110 cultivars and some species, uh, trees of South America, a ficus tree collection, plants of Mexico, uh, angle mangrove, 
uh, oak collection, avocado grove, the aquatic garden, plants of the southwest, eastern U.S., north temperate Asia, and a new garden recently opened and had an opening ceremony for it called the Garden Quiet Reflection. Um, our crew is also a floating crew, the people that I'm with. Uh, we kind of do projects all around the Arboretum as well. So we mostly have had a hand in probably the entire 127 acres at this point. Um, just these last few months alone, um, in December we had that crazy rain. And I remember it was Saturday morning when we woke up, it was just myself and another guy that worked on Saturdays. And it was crazy rain, it was New Year's Eve, and I lost two and a half 50 footer ficus that just kind of went across the road. Um, but you know, we learned chainsaws, so that's kind of what we do. So um, we chopped it all up, we cut it, we cleared the road in like four and a half hours between the two of us. Um, but that's why it's good to learn tractors too, so learn the tractor class. Um, and we're also trying to bring back the herbarium, which has been in dormancy for about 20-ish years. Uh, just this Tuesday when it opened the cabinet and we were trying to clean it and sanitize it, um, a moth came out, so of course we caught it. I'm also a TA for a biology class right now too, so I had my net with me. So I uh, caught it, we put it in a jar, a killing jar with uh, acetone in the cotton ball, and so we collected it. And the, the woman I TA for her husband is an entomologist, so I was just like, hey, what is this? <laughs> It's an outlet moth. So we'll figure more about that later. Um, oh yeah, so I wanted to tell, uh, thank you. I can't tell you enough how grateful I am to have come from Mount Sac. Um, it's not an exaggeration when you hear that Mount Sac has a strong reputation when it comes to their students going out in the field. The practical knowledge that is taught in class and the hands-on experience that you get um, in the projects and working at the horticulture unit is really relevant today. Um, please go to the horticulture unit. Um, if you're a student taking classes in the program, um, I implore you to please be involved. Make sure you get experience in learning how to grow plants, the greenhouse maintenance, plant sales, and tractor operations. A lot of these skills are stuff that you get, you gotta get these mistakes out of the way. There's some stuff that you just, I mean, I learned a lot of stuff. I made tons of mistakes. I learned a lot of things on the tractors. It was kind of, but you know, we come into a new job, it's fine. Um, it won't cost you your job or privileges like they will in the future. And if you haven't taken advantage of living in the trailer of the farm, uh, let me tell you, it's a dream to look back on because it isn't forever and the opportunities um, are pretty rare. Um, you won't really find that. So you get a more involved look on how the horticulture unit operates, even on the weekends and on your time off, you're living in a beautiful nature paradise. Um, and that experience is just forever. Yeah, you see a lot of wildlife at night at the, at the farm. It's, it's gorgeous. <laughs> Um, the biggest skill I learned in the, this program that I'm super grateful for is the tractors. Being good and being comfortable at operating uh, the tractors and the pesticide, pesticide rigs. Taking the tractors class teaches you the knowledge on how they work and how to operate them properly. You learn the different styles of tractors. You learn that there are things to consider, there are things to see, things to look out for, things to listen, because all the different sounds mean different things sometimes. Um, but these are things you can only really learn by practicing. Even the class alone may not suffice. Um, and the reason I say this is because it was actually really difficult for me personally in this current job um, to get on the tractor. Uh, and this is coming into this job with experience. So I show them my resume and I explain my experience and was still constantly having to, um, I have to be, have the tractor orientation. And so they just kept putting it in the back burner. But once they finally let me have that orientation, I saw that I was being trained with two other guys that had zero experience right in the thing. Um, but as soon as we did the orientation, I just ran with it. You know, the amount of times I've loaded some hefty logs um, after a windstorm. Oh yeah, we had the windstorm in January. That was fun. Uh, drag trees, loaded mulch, rolled bunches of green waste into like little haystack rolls and then just dumped them into the dump truck, you know, saving us a lot of time and labor. Um, even my supervisor that was hesitant to get me on the tractor is now sharing his tricks and he's sharing me his shortcuts. Um, and I even got featured during Women's Day um, for being on the tractor. And, but I know that if I walked into that job and had zero experience like the other guys, I probably wouldn't be on this thing right now. So please take the tractor class and learn as much as you can. Because yeah, it's fine. We're actually about to get a bobcat um, pretty soon. And uh, I already know how to ride the skid steer things to Mount Sac, so we're gonna be operating it. It's pretty exciting. Um, we're gonna be redoing the Alachel pretty soon. Um, 
I wanted to say my thank yous to Jennifer Hinestroza, who uh, taught me horticultural science that actually got me hooked into the program. I was kind of a biology environmental brat when I first got here in college. And um, I was in humans in the environment, all that stuff, anti-ag, whatever. But I took, I took horticulture science, and that was kind of what you know, turned me around. Um, she knew the answers to all of our questions, and it felt like opening the secret door to a world that was slowly becoming more reachable. She taught us plant identification, where spelling counts, uh, horticulture, and general horticulture, which is the foundation of pretty much everything I know, so thank you. Um, I also want to thank Irma Arvizu, who is a tank, and she's a forward-thinking role model. Um, when we first began working together at the horticulture unit at students, I remember all the times she would look around and she would say, wait a minute, why are we doing this the hard way? There's gotta be a better and easier way to do it. And by God, she always found a way. Um, she's very independent, very headstrong in the most admirable ways. I tend to learn from this as much as I can and take on this perspective a lot in my current job and I'm not, I try not to be afraid to speak up when things don't make sense. Um, I also wanted to thank Alicia Baugh. Uh, my last class before graduating was in landscape design. In Alicia's first time teaching it, she gave us a field trip to the Huntington Gardens and I was so in love with, um, with the place that I asked her if I could volunteer for her. Uh, she amazingly said yes, and in that volunteering gig, quickly evolved into a part-time job. It's probably one of the most incredible jobs I've ever had um, so far, working with some of the most lively, caring, and botanically knowledgeable people I've ever met. I felt like I learned so much about the botanical world just through osmosis, like just being around these people and their conversations and the plants they would bring and just being like, look what I found today, or like, guess what's blooming in here? It's, it's crazy, and um, yeah, just being around so many professionals in one room is just, it's, it's a pretty neat experience. Um, I, she's just as much as a highly intelligent and hardworking coworker as she is a professor, and I'm grateful to have had the time around her as a person and as a role model. Um, I highly recommend applying for their positions, because the Huntington's having some positions open up when you can, and volunteering if you have the time to do so. So if you don't get the job, try to volunteer. Um, it's kind of like, Volunteering is basically like interviewing. You know, you find out what your boss is like, what the environment's like, see if you like it, you know, and they also will see if they like you. So, um, you know, it's pretty good. So please volunteer. Um, I know it's kind of hard sometimes with like rising gas prices and, um, you know, it's, it's a little hard to, you know, do stuff for free, but when you're learning and you're trying to get on your feet, it's honestly one of the best and fastest ways to learn. It's just by being around these people. Um, oh yeah, you also get free admission to walk through the gardens if you're a volunteer. So, there's perks too. Let's see. Um, in that part-time job, while I was still working at the Huntington and going to school, I was also doing a part-time job, um, an internship in Rancho Santa Ana that's now California Botanical Garden for Mariner's Air in the herbarium collection. They have over a million plant specimens and are the 10th largest herbarium in the United States. I worked for her for about 12 weeks with an extension and was also offered a job to work for them. Um, but I didn't take it because I was in the middle trying to get my bachelor's. Um, so I didn't know where that experience was gonna take me, but hey, now we're trying to revamp our herbarium. So it kind of worked out um, to have taken this random experience. Um, let's see. While getting to that degree, I also did, and also still working at the Huntington, I did another internship with the LA Arboretum and worked for them for 10 weeks. The superintendent was impressed with the way that we finished our tasks, which was pretty cool. Um, he rushed some garden positions just to hire us, actually, um, and he kept reminding us until we applied. So we still had to go through the county uh, hiring process, which is super crazy long and takes forever, but don't worry, you'll get there. Um, and the exam included answering gardening questions like how do you deal with pests? What are some common pests that you'll see in the garden? How do you know what fertilizers to apply and what factors you consider when you want to place a plant in the gardens? How do you create an accomplished task in your job? So a lot of these questions are kind of like if you pay attention to class, you can really pass this exam. Um, so that's pretty much how I got here to this point is just going to school but really volunteering and doing internships doesn't even involve the side jobs and stuff, working in people's houses, just get out there um, while you're still learning as much as you can. Um, boop. 
things I wish and I did and learned in Mount Sac. So I don't have a lot of free time right now, which is kind of a bummer. And when I do have free time, I'm really freaking tired. So I kind of wish I took the certified arborist in the QAL exams while I was still a student because I was younger, had way more energy back then and not as tired as much as now. I wish I took the engine repair class because um, there's a lot of things that we take care, that we kind of do in-house because it's cheaper. So we actually repair our own chainsaws and pole saws. Um, we do our own maintenance on the equipment. Um, we also do, I also wish I took the student position in tractor maintenance because apparently we also do our own tractor maintenance. But my supervisor does it and he's retiring in three years. So I'm trying to learn fast. And um, I also wish I learned construction classes because there's a lot of stuff that we're being involved in right now that involves a lot of construction terminology and I don't know it. So kind of learning, learning on the go at this point when it comes to that. Um, so just in general, please don't be afraid to try new things and gain more experiences. Like join a horticulture club, go to the Calico trip, work in the horticulture unit, become a student live on, help with plant sales and other horticulture activities if you can, volunteer and intern at other places. My Mount Sac experience was kind of unorthodox in the sense that I did a lot of experience in, like at Mount Sac, but also went out as much as I could. Um, Join the plant societies. Our plant, our plant societies are kind of hurting right now with COVID. A lot of the elderly people who were generally running these plant societies um, have been going through a lot of struggles. The Epiphyllum Society, we host the Epiphyllum Society and their Fern Society um, at the LA Arboretum. We have their shade houses, we take care of their plants. But um, yeah, COVID really hit them hard. So there's only right now for the Epiphyllum Society, there's only one guy who's in his 70s who tries to take care of the 10,000 plants of the Epiphyllum collection. So we're trying to help them out, but if you guys can volunteer, please help and join. Like, we'd really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, learn more real life experiences of the jobs because it's more than just taking the classes, it's also learning how to do the job. So it really helps putting it all together. It's like weaving a quilt, you know, it's your quilt. Um, but yeah, so don't be afraid to ask questions from people around you. And always don't be afraid to try new things. Like. Learning chainsaws was really tricky, but the craziest part is that I learned chainsaws and then not even six months later, I was already running a chainsaw crew. Um, we did this crazy three month project of cleaning the entire palm and bamboo section of the Arboretum. And at the same time, teaching people that went to the chainsaw training and had no chainsaw training after and needed help. So no fingers were lost. So that's the best part. So. Um, but yeah, but just don't forget to try new things and remember you're always gonna suck when you first start But that's just the start of it. However far you take it is how far you go. So anyways, that's it um, That's my email if you need me and please feel free to reach out Sorry. Sorry. Ruben, are you here? <laughs> He's hiding somewhere, right? He's like incognito. So, all right, our next speaker. Wow, where do I start with Ruben, who is now the manager of grounds at Mount Sac here? He uh, talked about spending a lot of hours at the horticulture unit and, and helping, you know, Jesus and Dave build something great. Uh, Ruben started off here probably when he was like five years old I think maybe but <laughs> but really he's he's put you know blood sweat and tears into into the program here at Mount Sac in a lot of different ways and I don't know how many of you guys have had a chance to meet him appreciate I know you've seen the work that he was involved with at one point in time even if you don't realize that if you've been at the horticulture unit and it's really a really cool opportunity to see him um, move up into different positions in the industry and land here at Mount Sac to be able to, to do what he's doing for the entire campus now. So um, I'm gonna let him finish his story with you guys. So Ruben, 
Give a hand for Ruben. All right, Ruben Flores. Well, everyone's kind of talked about everything. Me and Liz have the same experience, practically. Um, but uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Ruben Flores, I'm the manager of grounds here at Mount Sac. Um, so a little bit, I wish I had time to talk about my whole story, like my story before Mount Sac story. But um, I'll just stick to the Mount Sac story. So like Brian was saying, um, yeah, I started here right after high school. I actually moved on to campus the night before uh, fall of 2008, before uh, fall semester. So from then, I was a live-on um, student worker. I helped uh, with the horticulture club. I was president for a few years. Um, participated in landscape competitions. We did plant sales all throughout the year. Um, helped with a lot of uh, plant setups for different events across campus. And I'm sorry if anyone works at the Hort unit and you have staff that come by still and say, hey, I need plans for an event, and expect you to do it on a whim, because <laughs> usually I'd accommodate. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, yeah, I spent about six years living on campus, um, just primarily taking night courses. Uh, it took me a little, little while, um, but I got it done. And uh, like Liz was saying, it, it's such a great experience if you, if you get the chance to do it. Um, I wasn't anticipating on moving out right after high school, but it happened, and um, you know I, I I don't regret a second of it. Um, Dave Lana was my mentor. Uh, I got to spend quite a bit of time with him uh, on the daily, and I know my professor from my high school ag uh, program. He was always in awe of Dave, and for those of you who have, have met him and had a chance to you know learn under him, he was a like a superstar in the industry and. My professor always was like, oh my goodness, you get to have lunch with Dave Lanham. <laughs> he just thought it was the coolest thing. Um, but Dave, Dave Lanham and Jesus Ramirez definitely were my, my mentors throughout the program. Um, and just looking up front, you know, Jennifer, Brian, and Ch even and Chaz, those, uh, you guys have great resources you know, right in front of you. Um, I know I, I uh, talk with Jennifer quite a bit across campus-wide issues or campus-wide landscape um, committees. And I, I still go to her. She's, you know, I many times mentioned her as the, the guru <laughs> for Plan ID. But uh, one thing looking back is I didn't realize how valuable the coursework was. You know, when I transitioned over to grounds from working at the nursery, it allowed me to move up and down and, you know, all throughout different positions over there. And it, it actually, you know, it's, it landed me where I'm at now. So definitely take advantage of that. and. Um, ask questions, you know, get to know the ins and outs of everything. I think it's one thing to learn the material and to be able to understand it in your head, but to be able to teach it and have somebody else understand it in their own way, that really says a lot and it, you know, it, it's a different level of understanding the material. So take advantage of the resources, ask, you know, all the questions you can. Um, no question is a dumb question. Uh, but uh, again, and also try to find a balance. I think that's something that I learned is I chose work more often than uh, my coursework. And so I wish, well, I, I wish and I don't wish because it, it, it gave me those experiences, you know, all the plant sales and loading trucks late up at night and, you know, over the weekends. And um, it was a great experience, but I think, you know, make sure you don't lose sight of your coursework and focus on that, get through the program, um, just to have you, you know, start in your industry. If, if you're new to the industry, start sooner. If you're already in the industry, maybe, you know, it'll help you advance sooner. Um, but that's something I think is a takeaway. And then uh, one other thing is that we just wrapped up a recruitment for a uh, grounds lead position on campus. And I can't share too much detail, but the, uh, of the, Two-thirds of the top finalists were Mount Sac uh, past and present students. So that really says a lot. Um, the fact that the runner-up, he didn't get the position, but the fact that he applied not only for a grounds position, but it was a lead grounds position. He didn't have much experience, but his coursework really um, helped him along the way, and it made us you know, take a second look. So 
just something that I could share. You, uh, I don't. If you have any questions um, after, I'll stick around. But favorite class? What's your favorite class? Oh, uh, maybe your first IPM course that I took. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think favorite class would be uh, Tree ID. I, I, that's just something I gravitated towards. Um, I know there was a few semesters where um, Jennifer had some students who needed a little help, and I was I was like the unofficial tutor of Tree ID, but. Oh, I guess I was official today. No, but that was just something that uh, I enjoyed the most, and I don't know. I guess I just have a good memory for Tree ID. Ruben, when did you when did you get your degree? Uh, um, <laughs> it is. It was after I had transitioned to grounds. Um, uh, 2016, maybe. So not that long ago. Not that long ago. So I'm embarrassed, Ruben. Oh. Oh. As a student, right? Yeah. 2008. Mm -hmm. So 2007 was my first year as associate dean, and I used to see him. I, I used to sign his paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and uh, this morning, right? What do we have this morning? What didn't we have? There's so many events going. On. Right. The management meeting. Oh, the management. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, it's better than my speech. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> yeah. We should have taken a photo of you. That was, no. <laughs> I, I didn't realize. Seriously, that's the kind of thing you don't think you can do. Mm -hmm. you, you don't know you can do it, but you can do it. It's just you have to you have to vision it, you have to believe in yourself, and then you can do it. And and I just I, I when you said manager, you just kind of blew it off. Like, yeah, I'm gonna make it round. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So earlier, hi Sarah. Hi. Earlier, Jeanette said PCAs, I think the descriptors were critical <laughs> and essential. <laughs> and essential, not just during a pandemic, we're talking all the time. So a P PCA is a pest control advisor, licensed pest control advisor. It's not an easy license to obtain. In terms of industry certifications, it's probably uh, takes you the longest to get there to even qualify to take the exam, and the exam is not easy. Um, PCA is, 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 first of all, it pays higher than the average job. And you see more stuff, and you do more problem solving. And in short, it's, it's a great niche in the industry, and a lot of the PCAs are phasing out. And so as a PCA, being a member of the California PCA uh, Association, they're, they're constantly telling you that they're, they're transitioning out. These folks are retiring. They've made a great career, and they're retiring, and there's a need to fill those roles. And our Integrated Pest Management Associates degree is suited to meet that, uh, the educational requirements for that exam. You need work experience in addition to completing the IPM degree to qualify for the PCA exam. If not, you need to have a four-year degree in an ag-related ag field, ag or plant science, just to sit to take the exam. And then once you do your practicing, then you're an essential and critical component of the ag industry, or turf and ornamental. And uh, so, so Sarah, 
you know, <laughs> Sarah, st Sarah stumbled into IPM. And I, and I and I stumbles probably a bad word. She it's like she sniffed IPM out. And then it's been years, but my memory of Sarah is that she was just even when she was talking to me, she was moving forward. Like there was just a level of forward movement and engagement. And I and I remember thinking like this one. This one's going somewhere. And like even if it's not with us, she's she's going to capture whatever it is that she's moving towards. And and I think she's a great example of a uh, of a niche that many of our many other of our students can fill in a very fulfilling career role. So I'm gonna let her come up here and tell the rest. Sarah, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Chaz, for that introduction. I wanna apologize now. I did not get the memo that we needed to do a PowerPoint. So you're getting the raw Sarah Prettel experience right now. Um, so I am a pest. <laughs> okay. Um, I am a pest control advisor. I have a qualified applicator's license and a plant science degree from Cal Poly Pomona, and a minor in pest and disease management. I currently work for Micah Chandy Farms. Uh, we pack and ship under the gem pack label. If you're in Costco, go look for some gem pack berries. I probably walk the field and help grow those berries. Uh, I started out at Orange County Produce working in snap beans and uh, walking the fields, doing the fertilizer, doing pest management and we had just acquired our, our mechanical harvester, so I uh, got to learn a lot about the mechanics of an Oxbow BH100. Uh, and a lot can go wrong on those things if you don't properly grease them. So properly grease your equipment, please. <laughs> um, so I want to start by how I stumbled into the industry, and I want to thank Chaz a lot because I would not be here in my current roles if it wasn't for him, to be honest. I was going to Cal Poly Pomona. I was working on Spodra Farm, uh, you know, driving tractors, pulling pipe, moving pipe, harvesting, watching the guys fertilize and spray and just learn everything that I can could at the time. And I needed a letter of recommendation and I came back to the department and I uh, saw Chaz and I said, hey, can you, can you make this happen for me? And he said, yeah, but would you wanna come back in middle of May and go for a, I think middle of April and go to a strawberry field? And I said, yeah. And it was the, uh, one of the best experiences of my life because I had, Grown up in Orange County my whole life, I'm, I'm from Seal Beach, and I had no idea there was so much agriculture in Orange County, and it really showed me, like, wow, there was, you know, agriculture in my backyard, and I had no idea. Um, but I met a man named Mark Lopez, and he is the uh, president of the Orange County Farm Bureau, and at the time I was re receiving a fellowship um, for working on a Spodra farm and being an individual from Orange County. And so it just so happened we were entering summertime and I needed an internship. Uh, my internship that I was gonna take in Hawaii fell through and it was honestly probably for the best. So I took this internship uh, with Orange County Produce and I was literally started out Half my time was going to be working in the office and understanding how the office works and paperwork of an agricultural production agriculture company. And half my time was out in the field, uh, the actual tangible hands on growing of a commodity. And we were growing at that time around 800 acres of snap beans covering all different cities. Uh, in the county and especially in uh, Chino, uh, the West Westwind Ranch through Cal Poly Pomona, we were farming out there as well and then ended up farming at Spadra 
uh, with Cal Poly Pomona as well. So that's, that's kind of like how I got my foot in the door. But like Chas said, like there was just something within myself driving me to get there. And it's important to t take every opportunity, even though you don't know it's an opportunity, every field trip, every conference, every interaction, treat it like it's an interview. And I must say that will help you immensely into getting you to where you want to be um, and advancing your career. Um, and education doesn't, education can help immensely with getting your master's and getting your PhD and going that extra mile because it just opens up doors. Uh, that's one of my things that I've struggled with, with being a full-time person in this industry and wanting to go back and get my MBA. It's, it's a little bit more difficult. So when you're going through these next steps in your education, like just go back to back to back and just bust it out and get it done because that's going to, you won't have any questions about, oh, should I have gone back or not? Like, no, you just, you did it. So my favorite class was obviously IPM, but one of the hardest parts about that class was the freaking grasses. He lines up like 15 or 20 different grasses and you're supposed to know what those grasses are even though they all look like each other. And so that was a, a moment in my education that I'm like, wow, I need to step my game up. I really like, it lit the fire under my butt to seek out more for myself in the way of like educating myself and buying books and going on UC IPM. Any, any UC website is going to help you prepare for the Department of Pesticide Tests if you want to go that route. And another thing is about that class was there's so many mini tests that those questions are actually in the test, the pest control advisor test and the qualified applicators license test. Um, and it just prepares you so much if, if you do want to go that route. See me? Uh, <laughs> um, one of my mentors I mentioned was Mark Lopez. Uh, he he's a qualified applicator. He worked for started out at Home Oil, and then now it's called Orange County Land Management. And he is the spray guru of the county. And it's so important if you're working with elders, if you're working with people between 55 and 75, it's so important to suck every piece of information from them because the moment they leave that industry, that knowledge is taken away with them. So if we don't pass that those tools down properly, we could potentially have a great gap in, in the food production system. So. Another thing is um, Orange County Farm Bureau is a great resource. And if you guys are seeking a more interactive industry to education and what need to seek resources, Orange County Farm Bureau is a great organization to have and to be a part of and it will open doors so no matter what county you're going to end up working in seek out farm bureau because you're going to learn so much on water conservation on regulatory issues that are coming down the pipeline and just the network alone that it provides uh, 
will be a great tool for you. Sorry, <laughs> um, the lights are really bright. <laughs> So one thing that I wish I knew back then was pr properly preparing for the classes to, to get everything out of them. You know, you pay for these classes, you truly do make it your own, and if you just sit in class and don't ask questions, then you're doing yourself a disservice. So I, I wish I took the syllabus at the beginning of the term and just went topic by topic and researched those topics and then had a bank of questions to come to class with because that interaction between the teacher and the student is so important and most of the time the teachers have one foot in the industry and one foot in education so they bring so much tangible life experience to the education aspect. And something that makes that a little bit different, I mean, you have your universities, a lot of them are research focused, but Mount SAC truly focus on the individual and shaping them to be ready for the industry. So the tractor classes, the, en the engine repair classes, the nursery classes, the propagation classes, like you use all of that in the industry and that's something you're not gonna find most of the time at a four-year four -year university. So I think that's one of the greatest things about Mount SAC is that it combines industry and real life with career. Does anybody have any questions? Can you see past the second row? No, I can't. <laughs> it's really. What's the day to day like? What's the day to day like being a PCA? What are you? Okay, so I I currently drive around to Santa Barbara County and Ventura County and Orange County. I go to Santa Maria about once a week and uh, Ventura once a week, walking strawberry fields. Uh, the rest of the time, I'm in Orange County walking strawberry fields, and I currently walk the 100 acres of bell peppers in Seal Beach. Uh, shout out Syngenta, I love the Actara, and I love the Warrior. They get me through pepper weevil season, and pepper weevil is no joke, like that is the most, like economically destructive pest to uh, to bell pepper crop. Uh, they literally, you, and you can't you can't really see what they're doing. So that makes it so much harder to actually scout for the pest. We use these pheromone traps, and you just gotta track where they're moving because the once they're there and the damage has happened, the dam I mean, it's done. The, the, the tiny bell pepper drops from the stalk and you're never getting it back. It's like, you gotta wait for the next flush, which is weeks out and you're, you know, you're trying to tell the grower uh, what happened <laughs> and why there's a gap. So it it's, was a learning curve for me going from snap beans to strawberries and then going to bell peppers because it's, um, it's definitely a different type of crop and vegetable. Uh, my next job is working with uh, Glenn Tanaka and Jimmy Otska and uh, growing strawberries in a hydroponic setting, which I had never worked with, never, never done before. And it's been one of the most rewarding experiences with going back to these farmers who have so much experience, who have so much life knowledge, and being able to extract things from them that I wouldn't be able to get if I weren't working with them. And it's, um, it's really 
grown grown my heart and my my head so my knowledge If you can't tell, my face is really red because I forgot to put sunscreen on. So if if you're somebody who's like me, please apply a lot of sunscreen because you're gonna be outside. <laughs> you're gonna be outside for basically like an eight-hour work shift. Like you're gonna be working from your truck. They're gonna give you a laptop. They're gonna give you a phone, and. You're, you're, it's all hands on deck at that point. You're walking acres, you're walking really, really cruddy ground that you can trip on. So, you know, strengthen your ankles, strengthen your body. Because it's so, this is real life, man. I'm giving you real life experiences. <laughs> and, um, you, you need to understand that. Each grower is different. E each one has a different tolerance for pests. And there's a finesse aspect to this of finessing the grower because they, they don't always want to want to do what you're recommending. So there's a finesse aspect here on how to talk to each different grower because you have some growers who are very open-minded and you have some growers who do the same thing year after year after year and they haven't changed anything in 20 years and you're growing on depleted ground no no nitrogen and when you don't have a strong crop from the from the root system you're you're attracting all these pests so now you're dealing your job's already pretty difficult because not every spray job, not every coverage is the same. Every operation's different. They have different spray tractors. They, I won't say the name, but some of them, you know, their tractors leak in oil. So you, you gotta fix that. So it's like every year I gotta tell this one grower, hey, your, la your tractor's leaking oil. Oh, thanks for the heads up. So there's so much more than just, <laughs> there's so much more than just like, caring for the crop it's it's understanding all the outside aspects all the the cultural aspects of what's going on and, and the weather the weather is something that changes so drastically and the last two years have been dry and the wind has been insane from Santa, from Watsonville all the way, you know, no, from San Joaquin Valley all the way down to Baja, all the way down to San Quentin. So knowing when that weather shift's gonna change and being basically like the, uh, you're gonna be like a weather person on on the news. Like that's, that's kind of like the mindset you have to be in because you could get a wind event and it could push a whole mite population into your strawberries while they're taking down 200 acres of avocados right next door. So all those mites and everything that was in there just flew into your field and you can't do anything about it besides spray as best as you can and get the coverage as best as you can. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what a great evening, huh? One more hand for everybody. So I'm going to close this out just by saying a few more words about Dave Lanham, because Dave Lanham Career Night. And I tell this story once in a while, but uh, when I was straight out of high school, um, I was trying to figure out what to do. And my dad said, hey, I went on some field trips over to this school, Mount Sac, and we did some ag stuff. And I wonder what's over there. We drove out here. And David just started working here, and he was out dreaming about what he was going to build. And I met him, and Dave just, like, you know, he just gets all fired up. I mean, 
it's I don't know he just had it about him and I came back to school here and and then you know many many years later I called him up for a letter of recommendation and for uh, um, for something that I was doing and he's all hey we got an opening you know why don't you apply and I did you know and then I was fortunate enough to get the job here and then uh, and what Sarah said about extracting the information from people you know she said you know the elderly I, I'm I I'm there you know I mean <laughs> no she didn't say that 55 to whatever you know uh, I'm there okay <laughs> but but Dave um, I, I, it was six years ago when we lost Dave just prior to career night I'll, I won't forget that and and knowing that uh, the knowledge he had it's not gone. <laughs> I mean, maybe some of it is, but you know, when I look around the room and, and who was directly involved with learning from Dave like me, and who's, you know, with the telephone game learned from Dave and, the, or, and passed that on in some way, shape, or form. And, and his legacy is, is gonna live on forever around here, and we're, we're committed to that. That's why we have the Dave Lanham Career Night. Um, and that night that, that we went on, career night right after, uh, literally right after he had passed away, you know, and, and having to face the future at Mount Sac without Dave around um, was sobering. But at the same time, we realized that, that education is a really cool thing and stuff like this is great because, you know, it, it's about what happens after we're, we're not here anymore, not like necessarily when we're here. And so as you guys go on and have learned stuff tonight and go on in careers, um, be very cognizant of the fact that, you know, carrying a torch and, and passing along and, and teaching people in whatever respect you're teaching in, whether it's in a classroom or in a training session or just t teaching coworkers, you know, things, it's, that's really important to do, okay? And that's why I came back is to just kind of keep that going. And I know a lot of people like Chaz and Jennifer excuse me, Chaz and Jennifer and Gretchen and, you know, all of our other faculty that are here, they're, they're here for the same reason. I know you guys feel that, right? I mean, I know, I, I hope that that really comes across, uh, that that's why we are doing what we're doing. So, um, again, for Dave, you know, we're always going to miss you, Dave, uh, and, and we're always going to remember you, and we're going to keep going on, and our career nights are one, is one way, just one little way we can keep honoring Dave, and all of you who have given presentations tonight, everybody who's here tonight, all the industries that were represented here. Just just thank you guys, you know, for being a part of this and uh, and keep carrying that torch, all right? So we'll see you next time. Please take your stuff with you on the way out, all your, anything you brought in, all right? Thank you. Have a good night. Don't forget your strawberries. Don't forget the berries. Sorry. Oh, and don't forget to look at the raffle on the way out, all the tickets, all right? <laughs>